Hey everybody, happy Mother's Day to all the mommies out there. I hope you're having an amazing day celebrating with your children, grandchildren, fur babies, nieces, nephews, loved ones. Um, yeah, um, I, I'm a little delinquent on my Mother's Day present for my mama, um, but sh sh she's not going to be upset about it. Um, it, I, I, I know I mentioned before I got a book just to write in with prompts like memories and things we did together and things she did that she didn't know about that impacted my life, things like that. So I'm about halfway through it. I'm going to try to get through it this week and send it to her. I already let her know, but my mother's never been a present hungry kind of person. She's more of like, it's the thought that counts kind of type. Um, apple tree. <laughs> um, so yeah, she already knows. And I honestly, I can't wait to finish it and give it to her because I think she's going to be a little bit surprised in a very, very good way. Um, anyway, I've got a lot of stuff I want to talk about. Um, <clears throat> speaking of mothers, when I get when I get done with William Bender of the Philadelphia Inquirer the investigative reporter of the Philadelphia Inquirer going on two decades now. He's going to want his fucking mommy. And Bill, Bill Bender, this might be the, the last Mother's Day you get to hug your mother. Because when I get through with you, next Mother's Day, you're going to be saying hi to mama from behind a plexiglass window. Um, yeah. Not happy with you, Bill Bender. I, I got a lot of good tips from some very credible sources on what you've been up to, and I'm going to talk about it. Um, but before I get into that, strain of the day, I got Bubba Fett going in the Elon Bowl. I'm going to take a little puffy puff. Fett today. It, yes, it's a pretty indica-leaning, heavily indica-leaning strain, but the stuff that I want to talk to regarding William Bender from the Philadelphia Inquirer, it's, you know, I'll be honest, it's a slap in the face. It's a slap in the face, so I, I want to be able to talk about it as coolly and calmly as I can, which, um, yeah, right, I'm going to drop like 30 F-bombs. Here's my guess. Here's my spade count. I'm gonna drop 30 F-bombs in 90 minutes. Let's see if I can, no, okay, no, no, no. I think that's too conservative. I'm gonna, cause I, I say fuck, like people say, um. Like, you know how people are like, um, um, um. I'll just, my feeling words like, fuck, motherfucker. Yeah, that's, um, oh, ooh, I guess I'm a liar. I just made a liar out of myself. I just said, um, I didn't say fuck. Um, I did just now. Anyway. So I'm on the Bubba Fett just to kind of help me keep on the lighter side today. I took um, some Northern Lights um, RSO, um, again, to help me stay cool, calm, collected, um, and grounded. And I'm also smoking, what am I smoking? I should probably know what I'm smoking. Get strawberry filled. Let me see. Mm, yeah, that's strawberry fills. That is for sure strawberry fill. I don't think of that. This is my last strawberry fills cart. I bought four half gram carts back in January because I mean it's just it's it's a toolkit strain. Let's put it like that. And for me, it's a generally pretty fun strain, like a pretty, pretty athletic, creative, social strain. I'm gonna, I haven't looked up Strawberry Fields on Leafly in a hot fucking minute, and I'm gonna do it right fucking now. Strawberry Fields forever. I'm not a Beatles fan. I don't hate the Beatles. I don't love them. I, I can literally take or leave the Beatles. I would prefer to listen to Pink Floyd. Um, Pink Floyd, then Zeppelin, then Stones, then the Beatles. No, Pink Floyd, Jimi Hendrix, The Doors, Zeppelin, then the Stones, then the Beatles. That's how I rank them. Um, you can hate if you want. It is what it is. 
Did I mention my nickname in fourth grade was AIDS? Yeah. Um, yeah. You can hate all you want. I also wore a, a headgear out in public in sixth grade. Very traumatic. Um, it's my long-winded way of saying you could call me an ugly fucking whore who's stupid, who spoon feeds herself semen and I'm just gonna be like okay yeah but in fourth grade my nickname was AIDS and I wore a headgear out in public in sixth grade yeah good luck with that um ooh, so let's see what we have we've got go up strawberry fields about 20% THC so slightly higher slightly higher and again that's just rule of thumb shit This is what the, the flower looks like. But if you ask me and Huckleberry, that, all, all that shit pretty much looks the same. Come the fuck on. All right, unless you're like a botanist. Um, so it's an indica. I didn't know that. I thought it was, I would have thought a hybrid, at least a hybrid. Uh, this is one of those things with cannabis and I would argue most other things in life, it, sometimes it hits you differently. Um, for me, strawberry fields, I mean, in fact, I'm kind of shocked. For me, strawberry fields has always kind of hit like a, a sativa leaning hybrid, um, like a party strain. So I'm curious to see what other people say now. I, maybe I'm just the odd man out on this one. It happens like that, especially with cannabis. Oh my God. Um, and that's not a bad thing. Um, Strawberry Fields by Sagamartha, Sag, Sagamartha Seas is an indica dominant hybrid strain that takes the flavorful strawberry cough, and I've heard of strawberry cough by the way, never tried it, um, and crosses it with an undisclosed indica parent. Hmm, interesting. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna guess, I'm gonna guess it's probably a Kush strain. Kush strains are very, 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 very popular. And it's hard, I, I'm hard pressed to think of a time when I saw a strain that didn't have some kind of Kush genealogy in it. Um, so I'm gonna go with a Kush strain is what it's um, crossbred with. Okay, so people reported feeling relaxed, sleepy, hungry. Okay, cool. Um, negatives, headache, paranoid, dry eyes. Yes, I will agree with paranoia. <clears throat> I've had to use strawberry fields sparingly for, it was probably like the end of January through March because I had a lot going on and I was really, really starting to unpack a lot of trauma and grief. So yeah, I had to, I had to give up strawberry fields for a hot minute because I just was not in the frame of mind for it. If I did smoke it, it would, yes it would cause feelings of paranoia. So if you're dealing with anxiety or if you're going through something right now where you need to keep the um, overthinking and overanalyzing at bay, stay away from this one. I just just my humble opinion. You're Again, it also hits me like a sativa. So, um, okay, strawberry filled strain helps with stress, pain, anxiety. Hmm, interesting. I'm, I'm surprised to hear that. Um, all right, let's get down to the reviews. Yeah, Strawberry Field Strain Reviews. I've got 100, about 170 reviews. It's got a 4.6 out of five stars on um, Leafly. I would translate a 4.6 to a pretty solid six and a half, seven on a 10 scale. Um, Cause you're not gonna see many strains on Leafly below 4.0, so. It's kind of useless for me to tell you 4.6. It's like having, you know when you go to McDonald's or like a fast food place, not really McDonald's, and it, they'll say like, there's a, a medium size and a large size. And you're like, how can you have a medium size if you don't have a small? Hmm. Interesting. Anyway, um, <clears throat> Also, full disclosure, I've only ever smoked the vape. I've never had the flower. I've never had any edibles that I know of um, that um, were of this strain. 
Um, <clears throat> so first review, they report euphoria, happiness, relaxation, a sense of feeling tingly. I do, I do appreciate a strain and it's rare that it happens, but there are strains that have like a real nice tingling sensation on your muscles. Um, I wasn't a fan of this when I first smoked it a few days after picking it up from my local shop, but now as the bag is running low, I have found that I, it had grown on me. It was sold to me as a sativa dominant strain. See, that's what, that's what I vaguely remember too, but I just moved to Kansas City, so I probably wasn't paying a super hell of a lot of attention. Um, it was sold to me as a sativa dominant strain and it looks like one. However, it smokes much more like an indica. The heavy body buzz is phenomenal and is first felt after the first couple of hits. The mind remains relatively clear and coherent. However, the body high alone is enough to get me stuck in my chair. Hallelujah. fucking Luya. That's, see, I'm sure it could couch lock. My experience is that it can lock into any activity. Like when I'm walking, when I first moved here, I could not stop walking. I, I was, there were a couple of days I walked 20 miles and I was like, there's no way I walked 20 miles. There's no way. Um, yeah, this is um, an activity lock strain is what I would call it. But of course, you know, maybe that didn't happen to them. You know, it happens like that. So um, the mind remains relatively clear and coherent. However, the body high alone is enough to get me stuck in my chair. The strawberry flavor only cements the fact that this is a solid strain. And I don't get into flavor profiles and fuck terpenes. I don't care. I just go for the net effect. But I will say the flavor is delicious. It's like, um, to me, it reminds me of like candied strawberry with just a hint. This is going to sound kind of weird, but 80s babies not watching this from home and previous to that, eh, I guess 90s babies too. Popsicle sticks, like when you would, you would eat like a fruit flavored pop. Like, okay, I guess Outshine, let's use Outshine for an example. Eat a, flu a fruit flavored strawberry pop. And you know how like as a kid, you would kind of like suck on the stick a little while longer and get that flavor out. Um, that's kind of what it tastes like on the exhale. It, a little bit of a very, 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 very mild, not unpleasant woodiness, but also that candied strawberry flavor. It's really good. Um, take a hit of the Bubba Fett now too. And at some point, I should probably explain why I layer cannabis products. I've noticed that it you get a very robust effect. Um, the most for me, again, your mileage will always vary, but I feel like I get the most therapeutic benefit from layering um, cannabis products. Um, so edible, vape, flower. Um, it's the the flower. I feel like gives you more of the mental release. Um, and for me, the vapes are so potent that they're almost sobering. They give me like a sobering quality to my thoughts a little bit. And the, um, the edibles, the ingestion or uh, ingestion, um, <laughs> the edibles. Why am I trying to sound fancy? Don't try to church it up, Felicia. Jesus Christ. I'm my own worst enemy. Um, the the edibles tend to give me marshmallow head where um, sounds are really nicely muffled and I tend to get that effect with the emotions where instead of overwhelming me and I can't sift through an emotion, it, it slows it down, it kind of muffles it so I can kind of process it a little bit more clearly without getting overwhelmed or panicked or flighty. Um, yeah, I I think, again, you have to, yeah, I'm not gonna use alarmist language, language like be cautious, but there is a learning curve to it. So what I'm saying is don't drop 100 milligrams of chocolate edibles, don't, um, don't burn through a half gram vape cart, and don't go through an eighth of flour in one day. What I'm, you know, Maybe layer 
two products and layer very gently, especially if you're using medical grade cannabis. Um, what I mean by layer gently, uh, for example, don't start layering with the flower, the vape, and the edibles. It might not even work for you. Would I get out of it? You might not tend to get out of it, but if you want to try it, start layering with two. I would suggest flower and edibles or vape and edibles. In fact, vape is probably the way to go. Um, if you're gonna, that, that's just me and mine. So um, take a one, two draws off the vape. Start with a very small amount of edibles. Now, talking in milligrams, I would say 10 to 20 milligrams tops, tops. Um, yeah, and, and see, see how you do on that. And then maybe after you, you develop a comfort level, how see how your body responds and the nuances and subtleties, then maybe incorporate a third layer to that treatment. But I, I find this very, very robust. Um, do I get out a lot out of flour? Yes, in, in, in vape and edibles, but I find that the effect is more robust and more effective. Um, and more nuanced when I layer. Um, and yeah, of course you're gonna find products that don't, you know, maybe have no effect. Yeah, it's a learning curve to it. Where are you going, Ducky? He's like, I wanna, I wanna see the, the bowl. I want some of that Bubba Fett. No, you can't have any. You're just a baby. You're just a baby. Here, I'm gonna show you guys Ducky. He's so cute. Look at this little guy. Ducky, you want to say hi to everybody? Duck, duck. Ducklin. You see peace? Ducky. You a good boy. You a good boy. Yeah, he's such a cute little man. Um, anyway, uh, the strawberry flavor only cements the fact that this is a solid strain. I highly recommend it for those suffering pain, such as headaches and inflammation. Okay, yeah, I, I could definitely see that or I probably wouldn't have been able to walk 20 miles on that strain mindlessly without any kind of painful sensation. Um, here's another one, creative, euphoric, focused, happy. Creative, yes, I definitely relate to that for, for strawberry fields. Had this in a cartridge, only three draws it took to get me stone, and I mean stone, yes, stone. Um, it's a creeper, introspective, um, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. I definitely agree with that. I'm going to take a sip of water really fast. My, I'm getting cotton mouth. Um, do another little puff of Bubba. Hey, Bubba. Hey, Bubba. This is my, the, the Elon bowl. I still need, I have, I, I got super glue like two months ago. I'm just terrified to try to glue the pieces. I've set them aside for safekeeping. I'm, just, I'm terrified to glue the pieces on there and fuck it up even further. Cause I've got my hands, I mean, hard, hard to see here, but I actually have pretty shaky hands. So um, yeah, I'm gonna have to suck it up buttercup and get it done. I, yeah, this is ridiculous. This is going on three months now. No, more than three months, because I think I got the Elon Bull. I think I got this like in early February. Somewhere around that. No, 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 no. Huh. And here's how I know Ducky is my child. Ducky, Ducky likes cigarettes, joints bowls really I mean I'm just trying to be you know use a cl cliche cigarettes and coffee um, as a kid I loved coffee we moved to Italy when I was very young I think I was seven when we moved to Italy and um, there was a confectioners in Aviano called Stradella's I believe it's still open a day um, but my mom got me um, cafe latte there for the first time and I was just like oh my god this is the most amazing thing ever also Italy had the most amazing um hot chocolate I've ever fucking 
had, even better than my own homemade hot chocolate, which is hard for me to believe, but it's true. Um, the truth hurts. Any mommy kisses? Ducky. Um, And when I was 10, my douchebag stepfather said, let's make a deal. I said, okay, because I, I always, like, it was always my um, agenda to try to placate this unplay, unpla yeah, insert fancy word there, dude. Like, just impossible to appease this person. Um, stop it right now. Stop. Do you want to go on timeout? Okay, all right, come here. It, you know, it was impossible to please him. So the deal was I would, I would get his coffee prepared the night before. No, I will put you in timeout. I, I would prep his coffee the night before and um, he, ha basically I would clean out the coffee pot. Yeah, I would get the dishes done from the dinner, the evening meal that I likely cooked for seven people. Um, Huckleberry, stop it right now. You're being very naughty. No, no. I'm not happy with this. I, I, would, I would clean up the coffee pot for my stepfather and I would, I would get that coffee pot ready for the night or the, the following day. And um, as a result, as exchange for my effort, I was allowed to have coffee. So I started drinking coffee when I was in fourth grade. And I've tried, I've tried to quit. I've tried to stop. I can't. It's in my blood. I need coffee. I need coffee. I have, I, I once went six months without caffeine or coffee. It was in, I wanna say 2017. Even after six months, I was just like, uh, still dragging ass. I need coffee, I love coffee, I love the flavor, I love the effect, um, I love the smell. Unless it's bad coffee, then of course I'm not gonna drink bad coffee. Um, anyway, Huckleberry, stop right now. You know, this is, this is the 2020s version of my mother being on the phone and doing the mother phone voice. Yes. Okay. This is she. All right. And like doing this, batting us kids away. Cause you know, we don't, who's on the phone? Who's calling? Who's calling? Who's calling? Is it aunt so-and-so? Is it uncle so-and-so? Is it so-and-so? Um, life of a military brat. Um, yeah, we would always be, I, maybe that all kids do that. I, I'm sure all kids do that, did that, but like just the whole who's calling usually implying one of my mom's friends that we hadn't seen in years or a loved one we hadn't seen in years. Yeah. So anyway, um, that's, that's the 2023 dog mom version of that. Yeah. I just put just kidding. People not watching this from home, do not twist my words. That was a joke. I would never ever hurt my baby. It's my baby. It's my baby. Um, anyway, holy shit, 23 minutes of rambling on? Fuck. I would make an excellent squadron commander. I have talked for nearly 25 minutes. I'm about to waste about another 90 seconds to extend it to 25 minutes um, and got nothing accomplished. Holy shit, how did I retire as an E6? Oh, yesterday, in my video yesterday, I called myself a senior NCO. My Freudian slip was really fucking showing then because yeah, in my opinion, my swan song, that was the behavior of a senior NCO, not a fucking junior ranking enlisted member. Um, and certainly my knowledge of the profession of arms, um, Probably put me toe to toe with um, 
if, if, if the testi testi testimony in Congress is any indication, I could probably go toe-to-toe -to -toe very easily with many of our senior ranking military officials on the profession of arms. And that's not, that's not to my credit. It's to their discredit. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, let me, let me put the Elon bowl down for a moment so I don't break it. Don't want to break it anymore. Yeah, I'm going to fix it today. That's my goal for today. I'm going to fix the Elon bowl. I'm going to give it a bath and I'm going to fix it. Um, I wanted to go over something that I saw on Facebook shortly before I started this video. It is deeply appalling. I'm going to um, warn in advance. I'm not going to show too much of it. I've already seen it. It is disgusting. Um, it is what I would consider child sexualization, child sexual exploitation. Um, how this is even up on Facebook still is beyond me. Okay, now it's not coming up. Hmm. So basically, it was this video on Facebook of a little girl. She couldn't, she could not have been more than three or four. And yes, I reported it. I absolutely reported it. Do you think Facebook gave me a field to enter why I thought it was child sexual exploitation. No, they did not. No, that. do you think I've been con- That's a serious accusation to make. That should trigger, when somebody reports child sexual exploitation on a social media platform, especially one that receives um, federal subsidies and um, has government contracts, that sh there should be like a triage system for reporting and that that should be one of those at the top i think the only thing above that is active shooter uh, this is just for an example example only active shooter take cover immediately with the general information of where the active shooting is alleged to be occurring um Twitter was able to clean up the, the new Twitter team, the um, the superhuman Twitter cleanup crew uh, was able to eradicate CSE on Twitter within, oh, a very short amount of time, 100%. They were able to remove 100% of CSE in a very, they made that one of their very first priorities. Wow. And I go on Facebook and I see what appears to be a three-year-old girl in front of an audience of adults cheering her on. She's gyrating. She's, this makes me sick to my stomach to even say what I'm about to say next because she doesn't understand. She's been taught to do what I'm about to say next. She's dancing suggestively that's not even the most disturbing part. And looking suggestively at the camera. It is so disturbing. I absolutely reported that. I have not heard back from Facebook. I don't know even if other people have reported that because Facebook doesn't have a transparency feature like Community Notes. It doesn't have, um, it lacks the leadership to urgently, expediently handle child sexual exploitation. Yeah, I'm probably never going to hear back from Facebook. But that video had like 80,000 hearts. There were people in the comments, grown-ups. Well, according to their profile pictures. I those those could be bots. Those could be people sitting console in a cyber ops squadron. I have no fucking clue. But grown up saying this is so cute she's so talented how i'm not talking about the little girl's dancing talent oh yeah i could make a whole different argument for that very gifted dancer doesn't mean she needs to be gyrating her hips at three years old nah nah oh no that's disgusting 
Oh my God. And, and to, to have had the coaching to be able to know how to even look suggestively and provocatively at the camera is barf. So barf. So barf. The adults in this little girl's life and the society encouraging this behavior have completely eradicated her defenses and her boundaries. This three-year-old child, there's no way she goes out into the world and understands that people aren't allowed to objectify her. There's no way. She's had her defenses removed and stripped away. This is disgusting. This is absolutely disgusting. Um, I, I hope they took that fucking video down. If I see it again, uh-uh. Uh-uh. Facebook, you guys, you guys need to shape up or you're going to ship out. You're going to start hemorrhaging users. People are sick. People, people from my background, which is most Americans, are sick. Are sick of the lies. We're sick of the opacity. We're sick of the gaslighting. Twitter, the now Twitter, Elon Musk has lit a fucking fire. And if you guys don't fucking change and adapt, Mark Zuckerberg, your empire will be no more. There's no reason why I should pull up a social media app that I use to stay connected with my loved ones and go to the watch tab and see children, children, performing in child sexual exploitative films and entertainment. That's criminal, Mark Zuckerberg. What are you doing about that? That is so criminal. You're benefiting from this. You've been benefiting from this. And, um, doesn't matter if that's not how you get your rocks off. If you're benefiting from it in any way, shape, or form, you're complicit. So you owe, you owe honest, hardworking Americans an answer, buddy. You sure as fuck do. That's disgusting. That is absolutely disgusting, Mark Zuckerberg, that you would allow this to go on. Oh my God. Barf. Um... You know, as I'm talking about it, the more disgusted I get, I, I, maybe, maybe this is my push to leave Facebook. Or maybe I just start reporting every case of CSE that I see on Facebook. Could do that too. I think I, I kind of like the other option. I do. Um, makes me feel like less of a hypocrite for wanting to stay in contact with my loved ones easily and without much. Um, but that's that's negotiable too. That's negotiable too. I'm I'm gonna start reporting child sexual exploitation and see Sam on Facebook and people not watching this from home. If you are of the same mind, then I encourage you to start doing that too. It's disgusting. We need to help this baby girl out. Absolutely disgusting. Anyway, I'm gonna move on. I, I think I've talked long enough about Mark Zuckerberg and um, CSAM book. Jesus Christ. Deface book. Defile book, pray book, as in P R E Y. Jesus Christ, Mark Zuckerberg, clean your fucking program up. That that's a human rights violation. I just saw a child essentially being peddled. That's what that is. That's an advertisement. Come get my kid. Um, yeah, on Facebook. That's on you, buddy. That's on you. I'm no longer gonna get I'm no longer gonna put it simply on the predators. You're giving them a platform to share this information and exchange this information, and you're benefiting from it, Mark Zuckerberg. That's on you. 
Um, so I did want to talk about um, Captain Ryan Summers from my my old unit, the 111th um, Attack Wing. Now Ryan Summers is was an Intel officer. He could be a Cyber Ops officer now too, for all I know. But um, something very interesting about his Twitter. Now, I, I don't think I'd ever tried to look this guy up on Twitter. I hadn't thought about him in a while. And I, I'd only encountered Ryan Summers a handful of times. And he was never unpleasant to me. Um, he was, you know, always had the appearance of somebody being kind. Um, I didn't really, like, know, know him. Um, but... Yeah, so I do remember it was, it was right around when Trump was running for president. Ryan Summers wrote an article in a news for a newspaper or for a publication that the chain of command. Now I have no idea what this article said. I can't remember if I saw it, but. They, it was um, very, uh, I guess it was politically divisive. I can't remember how so, but they weren't happy with him. And um, it was, they weren't, they didn't disagree with him. Let's put it that way. They just were like, hey, you can't put that shit on blast. That's why they weren't happy with him. I wish I could remember what it was about. Um, um, anyway, anyway, um, so I looked him up. Now, he is an intel officer, or was, but he likely still is, um, and very, very interesting. He's following 86 people, but he's got almost 2,100 followers. So, it's an interesting proportion. Um, not very typical for an intel officer. Um, you would think an intel officer would want to keep a low profile, especially if they're working the MQ-9 Reaper. Just saying, get into that. Um, so, Ryan hasn't tweeted since 27 March, 2021. Okay, not a big deal. If you look at the spread of his tweets, um, it's not uncommon for him to go three to four months on Av before he tweets. But what is interesting is his replies activity. He was an active um, replier I'm, I'm going back. Yeah, I mean, he hasn't, this is, it's not a super huge departure from his um, reply frequency, but it is a little bit. It, it's, it's a ripple in the pond, so, what is telling is the date. Now, it's he's a little out of phase for replying in the reply category based on his previous um, frequency. He's probably about two or three months overdue. The last day that he replied, 31 October, 2022. Now, I've long known that on the Huckleberry. Do you want to go in time out? Come to mommy. You come to mama. Come here. I've long known with, well, not long known, since I became active on Twitter a year ago, not long at all, just long with respect to a year. Um, so I knew pretty early on that the Parag and Dorsey Twitter had a lot of cyber ops console bunnies botting it up. So it's very interesting 
that literally the day that Elon Musk acquires the company, because it was very touch and go. I mean, this is very recent history. It was very touch and go. Elon Musk wanted to buy it. They said, he said 44 billion comes out. M m Huckleberry. The percentage of bots that they gave him was way, 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 way under, under, underreported. Let's keep it, not underestimated, underreported. Way underreported. So Elon Musk apparently came back and said, hey, you know, that's not a $44 billion product anymore based on what I was originally advised. Let's lower the price. And they said, no, no, we can't lower the price. Well, I'm not going to buy it. Well, you have to buy it. And then, well, I want to buy it. You can't buy it. Yeah, it was pretty nutty. Um, so that that's pretty recent. So not only is Ryan Summers about, I would say three to four months, I said two to three earlier, I've, I'm gonna go three to four months late um, with regards to his tweet reply frequency. His last tweet reply is very interesting in that it falls on the 31st of October, 2022, which I believe is the ex don't hold me to it, but I believe that's the exact day that Elon Musk officially acquired Twitter. Like, walked in with the sink. Um, so, very, very interesting timing for Ryan Summers. <sighs> Cable got shot, shut off today because Verizon sucks and I'd prefer not to take my little ones to a bar again, but I'm not above it. Tickets would be an above my pay grade treat. P.S. Imperial Pizza is great. The more beach, the better. Huh. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, so I'm going to keep an eye on Ryan. That's um very, very interesting. Uh, he's a little overdue for at least a reply on Twitter. And now, he might be active on Twitter. He might be, like, engaging with other profiles, reading other profiles. I don't know that. He might. I would be curious, like, just for gee whiz, if I could be, um, uh, the the um techno king for a day i would want to know what profiles this dude is active on like that would be very very telling to see which which accounts he's reading uh very very telling um hmm yeah i'm gonna keep an eye on ryan I, I, you know what i wonder if he has a linkedin let's take a look at his linkedin Ryan Summers. I mean, he, I just, I remember him being congenial, not like ov overly, con but if you encountered him, if you said hi, you'd be like, oh, hey. Um, but I don't remember him being too like conversation, like not, not aloof, not antisocial. I just, not somebody that I found, um, like I would have anything in common with it to, converse about yeah I just felt like like very small talky with him and I'm not a small talk type so um Ryan Summer is it Summer or Summers I suck uh let's just go back to his I'm surprised the 111 didn't make him take this down shit um Ryan Summers Philadelphia Ugh. LinkedIn LinkedIn. Hmm. Hmm. I wonder if this is him. Oh. Senior Director of Global Sponsorships, helping Bravo to Bravo SAS. It's um, uppercase S is in Sierra, lowercase alpha alpha, uppercase Sierra. Companies grow demand through account-based digital marketing and PER, brand journalist, speaker, USAF major. So he's been promoted. Okay. Um, peaceful warrior, servant leader. <sighs> yeah. 
diplomat warrior aristocracy. Um, I'm a senior marketing leader with 15 plus years of experience leading staff, generating leads, and building demand at SAP, a Bravo 2 Bravo company with a specialty in working with global sports clients. I manage internal and agency teams of 20 plus to nurture inbound leads and create digital strategies. This includes 360 degree marketing plans and reporting for global sports clients by creating personas and using social amplification strategies to drive excitement, to increase brand awareness at all phases of the customer journey. What does that even mean? Yeah, can you just like, I mean, dude, you're in the military. Just can you give a bullet statement? I, I don't even know what that means. I don't even know what your accomplishments are or what you have achieved as a result of that. What does that mean? I'm also a United States Intel officer major, congratulations, who oversees all facets of intelligence gathering and analysis, providing information and briefings to support critical decision making. Well, that's interesting. Because he's helping to create personas for um, global sports clients. And that overlaps considerab considerably with his uh, self-proclaimed expertise with human intelligence. Um, at least human intelligence. Mm. I'm not saying he's a psyop plant, but I'm not saying he ain't. I'm just saying. I'm not saying he is. I'm not saying he ain't. I am saying it's interesting. To me, that, that feels a little mercenarial. Um, my skills include Bravo 2, Bravo sales. Don't even know what that means. Product marketing. Okay. Sales enablement. What the fuck does that mean, sales enablement? Demand generation and a natural aptitude for digital marketing. I believe in mission first and people always. Do you? I didn't see you too much on the floor. Um, yeah, so that's interesting. Um, I and Intel people, Intel, you want to talk about a chronically, pathologically unhappy career field slash um, like uh, func functional area? Sector, component, well, it's not really component, platform, I guess. Intel, it, it, like, like, even, like, I, I used to, I used to know air traffic controllers when I was at Whiteman. I used to party with some of them. You would think that they would have it in spades, and they do. They, air traffic controllers, they don't have it easy. They get curb stomped by pilots all the fucking time. Um, and so their leadership, their leadership tends to be very, um, permissive about what they allow pilots to say and do and get away with, with the, the junior ranking ATCs. So you would think ATC would be the most toxic career field platform, whatever, function, right? You would think that, and there, there is, there is some of that. No, linguists have it by far more. And then Intel, oh my God. It, I never saw such toxicity as I did with Intel. Oh my God, and like I had, there were Intel flights, there were Intel um, squadrons at other units, other installations I was assigned to through the years. But this was the first time I was actually embedded with them, where I worked actively with them. Never have I ever seen such toxicity. And when I was medical, people always give women a bad rap in the office. I honestly, I've seen it EO, equal opportunity. I've seen men who act like bitches and women who act like cowards. Um, but... Um, I totally, this little, this little guy got me off track. 
Yeah, Intel, yeah, Intel was just rife with toxicity and dysfunction. I mean, just, uh, they all hated each other. Like, and then, then, like, Amy Smyzer would be like, I can't stand so-and-so. And then, like, five minutes later, so-and-so walks in the door, hey, so-and-so, how's it going? And I'd just be like, Jesus Christ, you just eviscerated them. Um, she wasn't the only one. She wasn't the only one. It was, it was a lot of them. I, very few, there, I mean, I did work with some great Intel people, I will say that. And I thought they were great for a reason because they tended to be the ones who didn't behave like that and weren't one-uppers and didn't walk around like their shit didn't stink and didn't walk around and talk to other people like they were the only smart person in the room. Um, yeah, th so there, there, there are those too, but it's, it's about 60-40 with Intel. Um, anyway, yeah. I I didn't see that reflected in the Intel morale, the 111th attack wing. And if he's an officer who apparently was good enough to be promoted, then he really can't say that. You can't say that, Major Summers. I, and I'm not saying he's unkind. I'm just saying he's not a leader. That's what I'm saying. Because the Intel shop at the 111th, John Riccio... Uh, E9 Woods, Scott Woods, don't even get me started on that fucking creep fest. Ooh, there's a story. Ooh, there is a story. Mm. Anyway, um, yeah, he's not a mission first and people always, he is a careerist. That much I can say for Ryan Summers. I knew that the moment I, I encountered him. I thought he's a kind person. He's not an unpleasant person, but he's looking out for himself. He is a careerist. And, and when you're a careerist, it's been my observation, you don't care what you do to get promoted in terms of stepping on people. And I do see that reflected in the morale and welfare of um, the intel bodies assigned to the ops group at the 111th attack wing. SAP, director, senior, regional lead, major United States Air Force, um, 22 years of service in the Air National Guard. He's a major, that's, but he also don't think that he doesn't want to get promoted. Um, he might have other coals in the fire that are um, maybe a little bit bigger than being a lieutenant colonel. Um, anyway, University of Phoenix, MBA. Ugh. Westchester University of PA, 2002 to 2004. He's got a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration. He went to Ridley High. So this is interesting. He has a big gap. Ridley High, 1994 to 1998. I didn't know we were the same age. I, I always thought he was quite younger than me. Um, 1994 to 1998. And then all of a sudden, Westchester University, 2002 to 2004. So what happened in those four intervening years? I mean, yeah, especially like especially if it's a military background, if it's a, a tenure where he was in the military and didn't disclose it, well, that's a pretty important time period to leave out with regards to military experience because it straddles um, like two years on either side of 9-11. So one would hope that we would be able to know his military experience if he served before, during, and after 9-11. And yeah, um, very, very interesting. Recommendations. Ryan worked on my customer alliances team at SAP and from day one was eager to learn more, take on new challenges, apply his skills, and lead a team. Additionally, but... Additionally, he serves that country and has a family with small children and still somehow manages to exceed expectations and is the first to volunteer to help where it's needed. I'd hire Ryan for any marketing team anytime. Yeah, 
guess what? His intel body suffered as a result of that. So, yeah. Sorry, Julie Rim. I, maybe Ryan didn't tell you about the enlisted force structure that had to pick up the slack when he wasn't there. Um, yeah. I guess he didn't. I Yeah. Ooh, Ryan, your privilege is showing. Um... Jesus, oh my god, this is so corny. 2H 2019 Marketing Excellence Award winner and Cultural Champion, SAP April 2020. Okay, I'm sure that's not some bullshit biscuit award. Um, yeah, all right, so now we're going to talk about my buddy William Bender. <laughs> William Bender is a journalist, he's the investigative reporter and investigative reporter for the Philadelphia Inquirer. Everything from South Philly mobsters to doomsday hucksters. Currently, government accountability, corruption, etc. This I heard from a profoundly credible source. William Bender has a highly undisclosed three-letter agency, PSYOP background. William Bender, why did you not disclose that to me when I came forward to you with good faith allegations regarding General, MQ, General Atomics MQ-9 contract with the Air National Guard? That would have been a great time for you to disclose that to me. Because if I'd known that about you, William Bender, I would not have sent you information I would have not even reached out to you. I would have known not to reach out to you. Absolutely appalling. So this is William Bender. He will be held accountable for what he's done. I am not the only enlisted force peon that he gatekeeped. I am not the only person that he has helped to harm for coming forward with information. William Bender is allegedly from an unshakable source, a PSYOP plant, in every sense of the word. He will be held accountable. Um, I, I am not letting William Bender get away with his crimes against our country. Nope. Nope. Um, I found his LinkedIn too. Let me go to it. It was very, very spotty, shall we say. Very, very spotty. And I think I know why. Those sources are any indication. So this is William Bender. This is A man who obstructs freedom of speech. This is a man who allegedly helps to harm honest people who come forward, honest people like me, with good faith allegations. William Bender is a Michael Schwierz of the New York Times. William Bender outed me to my chain of command, according to my sources. I am not the only enlisted force peon that he outed to the chain of command at the 111th attack wing in the Pennsylvania National Guard. William Bender has a lot of human suffering on his hands. He might not have been the one to pull the trigger, but he helped orchestrate and put that gun in front of the one who pulled the trigger, and then he helped to cover it up. And in so doing, harmed innocent, honest people like me who were required by Congress to come forward. So, William Bender, you owe your followership the um, courtesy of knowing what you've been doing with your career and how you've been gain gainfully employed and by whom that needs to be disclosed immediately. Um, not that I'll ever get it, but a personal apology would be very nice from you. It's not going to happen. You're a cowardly piece of fucking sellout shit. The worst kind of fucking turd.
reporter at Philadelphia Media Network, philly.com, Inquirer, and Daily News. Oh, I bet. Uh, bear in mind, this, this man has been a high-profile Philly Inquirer investigative reporter for nearly two decades. And guess what? Philly's all the worse for it. Philly's still corrupt as fuck, more so now than ever. What does that tell you? Do you need to ask, do we need to ask William Bender? Do, do I need to wait on William Bender to tweet on his Twitter profile, hey, I'm a PSYOP plant and I have an undisclosed three-letter agency background and I work with um, people um, to orchestrate very sophisticated plans to make sure honest people who come forward with information in good faith because they think I'm there to help them and get the word out. Well, now I'm there to I'm I'm there to help keep them quiet. Yeah, that's how the system is rigged against us. All peons not watching this from home. Yeah. Now it gets even crazier. So not only does this guy need a paycheck, DNA check like our liberty depends upon it. He also needs a professional genealogy tree. We also need to know who's, who his advisors are. Yeah. He just, he doesn't list his college. We have no idea what his call, his academic background is. He just, he just walks into Philadelphia Inquirer one day and boom, bing, bang, bam. You're a journalist for the Philadelphia Inquirer. I, uh, that's how this career started. Um, Philadelphia Inquirer might not be the New York Times or the Washington Post, but it is not a local circular gazette either. I mean, it holds its own. Jesus Christ. So I would like to know what the fuck did this guy do before 2007? Who were his advisors? Where did he go to school? What was the nature of his undisclosed service that he doesn't want people knowing about? William Bender has a lot of fucking explaining to do, but it gets fucking crazier. That same source, and it was mind blowing, and now, like, it never occurred to me, to me, but now I can't fucking unsee it. So you know how people talk about the Matrix? I always thought when people talked about the Matrix, um, and not just the movie, but like when they speculate or postulate or hypothesize that we're living in a Matrix, I, I always think they assume like, like a computer kind of, uh, I don't know, a, a computer AI inspired um, existence that we don't know we're a part of. That's what I always took it to mean. Um, what it means, what it can mean in the pragmatic sense is the way the establishment rigs the system of recourse against us. That's essentially the first coup. They take away our recourse. We don't know it because they put in either they intentionally plant incompetent people or they plant people who they know they can have do their bidding because they're in on the same gig. Um, this was fucking mind blowing. Like, talk about the Matrix. Talk about fucking pulling a pin. Talk about fucking J. Fuck the Matrix. Here's an even better fucking analogy. Jenga. Yeah. That, that fucking skyscraper. Yeah. Yeah. They got it. They got it a mile high. They finally got it a mile high, but they thinned out the bottom so bad. That now that, that Jenga skyscraper tower is just waving. Doesn't even need a breeze. It's just waving like Miss America. Waving, waving, waving. Um, yeah. Pull out one little Jenga piece. What I'm about to say next. And the whole thing is like an utter collapse. Very, very credible source. I'm still kind of like, whoa, over it. Whoa. <laughs> um, the, some of the most powerful people in mainstream media. 
You would think it's the editors in chief and you would not be wrong. According to the source, very good rule of thumb to use if they're an editor in chief of a mainstream household name publication, like to give you some examples, the New York Times, um, the New Yorker, the Atlantic, the Washpo, uh, can even be a conservative leaning major outlet for the controlled opposition. Um, yeah. Th those, those people, according to the source, you can pretty much, and it's not unanimous. It's a very, very, very reliable rule of thumb. Like we're talking like 90, 95% rating. If they're in an editor-in-chief position at any major newspaper, any major publication um, dealing with current events and the narrative, keeping the narrative going, which is all of mainstream media, um, no, nobody in mainstream media gets out of that. Not, uh, um, if, if they are in that capacity, you can pretty much assume with pretty good statistical reliability that they are either a PSYOP plant and or heavily associated with um, espionage related entities like three letter agencies, international agencies like Mossad. Fucking mind blowing. But now I can't unsee it. I can't unsee it now that it's been pointed out to me. So the editors in chief are extremely powerful. But guess who, guess who has the most power? And th once, once my, the source told me this, I said, holy shit. Oh my God, I'm such a dumbass. Guess which part of the mainstream media apparatus holds some of the most power in the game? The people who run the tip hotlines. It's insane. It's insane. Oh my God. Oh my God. So this source told me with respect to what I just said regarding um, high profile editors in chief, um, chiefs for editors in chief for uh, major publications, media outlets. Where is it? Uh, yeah. So the, the, the people who work the tip lines, the, the person who helms the tip line has a lot of power. They work in lockstep, not just with the editor, but also with the elite, the, 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 the people who basically keep the lights on. Yeah. For their 10 homes that they don't need. Um, yeah, they have a lot of power. They absolutely just very similar to the editors in chief. Um, if it's if it's the executive or director of the let's say New York Times tip hotline, yeah, you can pretty much count on them either being a psyop plant, more often than not, a psyop plant and involved in um, foreign intelligence operations and domestic intelligence operations with three letter agencies and not so three letter agencies like Mossad. It is fucking mind blowing. And I'm trying to wrap my head around the allegation, but the more I think about it, it's like, it's brilliant. If you were a mastermind, that would be a fantastic fucking way to rig the press. And to like do so under the radar. You have all these um, investigative journalists who are doled out the assignments and told what they're going to be working on. Not what they think is impactful or um, relevant or um, needs to be distributed or disseminated to American citizens immediately to keep American citizens safe. No, they're told what they're going to be working on. So the, the source said can't, can't overemphasize enough how much power the 
the person who manages, who directs the, the tip, the hotline office at these publications, very, very, very much read into very, um, very incriminating stuff, um, activities that would erode and damage, maybe even irrevocably, our American state, as in like a geopolitical term, our country, our national security. So, you know, I, I can't say that that is the gospel, but this is a very reliable source who has not done me wrong yet. Um, so it's definitely something that I'm taking into consideration. Um, with that said, paycheck DNA check like you wouldn't believe for William Bender of the Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, find out which university or college he went to, if he even went to one. Um, this might have been a <laughs> battlefield promotion, if you know what I mean. It happens um, where people see something they didn't see or they didn't see something that they most definitely saw. That happens too, um, so bear that in mind. Um, let's see what else. What else do I have? This is highly fucking fascinating. I received a tip that Amal Clooney is a Mossad plant. George Clooney is in on it, apparently. That's, yeah, an allegation that I received. Um, Ooh, some more fun stuff about um, Chris Ray. So, apparent, apparently, apparently, Chris Chris Ray is not against dominatrixes. Yeah, he. So, word on the street, he's not necessarily like rough himself in bed, but he doesn't mind being roughed up. Like the the more, like I was saying yesterday, according to the source, the more aloof. The more detached, the more insulting, and um, I guess not very not very attentive to him. The more attractive Chris Ray finds that person, which you know would make sense that he allegedly has a thing for spies. Because imagine how detached you would have to be to do that job. Yeah, you. It wouldn't just be like, tri like, telling yourself or convincing yourself I've got to be detached. No, that training's already been done. Like it's internalized. There's yeah. So that would make sense that he would be into spies who were just like, yeah, no, never gonna go anywhere, never gonna fall in love with you. Yeah, it, it it's mommy issues. Happy Mother's Day, Chris Ray. Um, anyway, let's see what else I got. Oh, I did want to tell a cute story. Um, you know what? Maybe I'll tell, I'll tell the headgear story. That's a really cute story. So, I think I mentioned before, um, I had pretty normal, um, normative interactions and behaviors up until things started um, falling apart at in our home with my stepfather's abusive behavior. Um, that would have been right around third grade. I started becoming, and I was always a shy kid, but I was not a withdrawn shy. I was just shy, was very comfortable being my, by myself. Um, and I, I, I even had friends, but I just tended to be shy and soft-spoken. Um, but in third grade, I started becoming not just shy, but withdrawn, and um, things falling apart at home tended to mirror how my academic life felt, right? So third grade, I was starting to become very withdrawn, and um, I, I, I didn't know it at the time, I didn't have the word for it, but very depressed, um, because things were spiraling at home, and it was bad. Um, I, in fourth grade, I 
picked up a nickname that I did not want. It was AIDS. Now, people not watching this from home who are of the younger variety, you might not be too familiar with the AIDS epidemic that <coughs> Fauci gain a function to. Yeah. Hi, Fauci. Yep. Yep. You're going to be held accountable for the AIDS epidemic too. Yep. Um, in the 80s and the 90s, the AIDS epidemic was in full swing. Shit, as much as I wanted to have sex as a, t as a teenager, AIDS was a very big deterrent. I was terrified. I was terrified in many respects to have intercourse as a teenager. Um, because that was a fact of life growing up in the 80s and 90s. So, um... In fourth grade, I picked up that nickname without trying. Somehow I inspired my classmates to come up with that nickname for me. Yeah, it hurt my feelings. It was not a fun time at all. At all. Um, so, but it, it, I'm not given bad behavior pass. What I am saying is they were kids. They were kids too. And I'm not perfect. I wasn't a perfect kid. I... I didn't tend to bully people as a children. That wasn't my character. But I I hurt people's feelings growing up too. Mostly unintentionally, but I done it. Um so yeah, anyway, anyway, get into the cute story. Um stand by for just a second. I was living in Italy at the time, and this is back when um, when DOD paid for dental care and orthodontic care free of charge. So my mom, after years and years of waiting, it took like, I want to say three years of, because yeah, it was free of charge, but you had to fucking wait. And guess who they prioritize? You think they prioritize enlisted force peons? Fuck nah. Fuck nah. So um, it was probably about our last year, year and a half in Italy that we finally got prioritized for um, orthodontic care. And yeah, I wanted braces. I know that might sound weird to people who've worn braces. I wanted braces. When I was little, one of my friends had a Cabbage Patch doll. One of my classmates in um, second grade, my first second grade, because we moved in the middle of second grade, had a Cabbage Patch doll with glasses and braces. And I was obsessed. I wanted fucking braces. I wanted braces so badly. Um, so we go back and forth from Aviano to Vicenza. Vicenza is an army base, an army post. Um, I can't think of off the top of my head what they, they do down in Vicenza, but pretty big army post, um, pretty close to Verona too, for all you um, Shakespeare buffs not watching this from home. Um, anyway, we back and forth to Vicenza, um, and my mom took us to, she would take us to Baskin Robbins, and I was obsessed, I was obsessed with Rainbow Sherbert. Um, so what I didn't know at the time is that the people pouring shit into my mouth to see what my mouth looked like by making a mold out of it, I didn't know what those, I didn't know what those motherfuckers had up their sleeves. Yeah. Apparently they had constant fucking Tina wire up their sleeves and they made me a fucking headgear. Yeah. They slapped a fucking headgear on my face and told me to wear it. I said, what? Like that kid from Punky Brewster? Are you fucking high? I didn't even know what high was at the time. I didn't say that. I just said, no, 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 no. I saw, I used to watch Punky Brewster. I know what that thing is. That is not going on my face. And the doctor said, you need this for your face. <laughs> um, so yeah. I got saddled with the headgear. My older sisters, who were a year older than me, the identical twins, they got braces. I was so mad. I was. I, it wasn't even mad. It wasn't even anger. I was crushed. I was crushed. I had dreamed about getting braces from the time I was in second grade until 
that time period. I was, I would have been in fifth grade at the time. I was crushed. But there was a reprieve. The orthodontist said, but you only have to wear it at night. And he did suggest to my mother to have me wear it continuously for the first several days to get adjusted to it. So I could sleep at night wearing it, basically, was the the um, the rationale. Um, so I'm thinking, well, okay, it's not that bad. I hadn't put it on yet, I'll tell you that much. I'm getting to that. Um, I was like, well, it's not that bad. At least I only have to wear it at night. Nobody has to know, nobody has to know. Like, I did not need any help after fourth grade. Like, I'd finally gotten to a... a a position in fifth grade where I still was not cool. I was still a fucking dork, but people weren't giving me shit anymore because I was sticking up for myself. And I was also very athletic. Like I was super good at, at Foursquare. I was super good at running. I was super good at sports, um, kickball, you name it. I loved it. And, um, yeah. So, um, Fifth grade was not that bad, actually. Yeah, now that I think about it, fifth grade was like, yeah. And I, I knew things that other people didn't know. So I'd be like, like I, I told a story, the story several, um, several months ago about drawing. Um, I wanted to help my friends out in fifth grade recess. They wanted to know what a penis looked like. I said, well, I, and I, it was a very, very medical type rendering. I mean, I was I was blown away with my work. I was like, wow, this is some of my best work. Like even for like the scrotum, I was able to draw in lines to, yeah. Miss Obel didn't appreciate it as much as I did. And she has a point, she has a point. Um, so anyway, no pun intended. I don't know if Miss Abel has a point. It's none of my business. Um, so anyway, fifth, where am I going with this? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's fifth grade. I just gotten my lip bumper t taken off. Thankfully, if, for people not watching this from home, a lip bumper is basically like an internal fucking um, headgear that an orthodontist cements to your fucking teeth. And it makes your lip jut out like this. Did I probably need one? No, probably not. Whoever whoever invented it is a fucking dumbass. Is a lip bumper. <laughs> um, so I hated the lip bumper. It made my hair hang it made it difficult to talk. And I didn't want, you know, what what school age kid wants to stick out like that? Yeah. None. So, um, the lip bumper came off because somebody, I was playing sports, that's right, it was a, it was a, um, a game called Nukem, and I was like, I'm not going to say I was the best in the schoolyard, but I was probably the best in the schoolyard. I was pretty fucking unbeatable, even among the boys. Um, so anyway, and I was very proud of that fact. So anyway, um... Uh, some, I, I caught it in the face, but I didn't catch, I, I, we were playing with a basketball and it hit me in the face first, but I caught it. I didn't drop it. I caught it. And that motherfucker popped that lip bumper. It, it, it separated the cement from my tooth where it was anchored to, popped it right off. And it was digging all into my, um, my gum. They had to call my mother. My mother, um, had to have me go see the dentist. I think I just walked to the dentist from school. If I remember correctly, I don't even think my mom came to pick me up because she wouldn't have had a car. Um, yeah, so walked to the dentist um, from the middle school on Aviano, which it, it was very small back then. Very, very, it wasn't like, you know, I wasn't walking down fucking 7th Avenue in New York City in rush hour. Um, nah. Dennis comes in, takes a gander, says, good news, young lady, we're taking this off. And I said, yes! I was like, really? And he's like, really? You really didn't like this. I said, no, 
No, I did not. And then shortly thereafter, my mom takes me to Vicenza and I get to find out what the sum total of all those visits to Vicenza were. And back in the day, um, we, we had, the, now this is coming from the family where the head of the household, my stepfather, vehicle maintenance, transportation, before it was called Logistics Readiness Squadron um, and Logistics Readiness, it used to be called Trans. Um, even though my stepfather was apparently such a gifted mechanic that he was waived by the Air Force from attending tech school, um, and even though for the first several years of his career, I want to say the first 12 or 13 years, he, he was, bless you, he was the fastest promoting enlisted member in his entire career field for his first several years in that career field. Yeah, he didn't get outpaced until he was a fucking, I think, till he tested for senior for the first time. Yeah, one of those. But we always had a broken down car and, and this was, this was nothing different. We had to rely on the motor pool, ironic because motor pool was a transportation asset, um, probably still is a logistics readiness asset. They've probably changed the name a million times to Guardian um, Motor Garage or Warrior Pool of Cars to make people feel good about what they're not actually doing. Um, anyway, anyway, um, we had to rely on the motor pool. Now, basically what the motor pool was, um, the medical group at Aviano would have, like, let's say they would have a critical mass of people who needed, like, a weekly trip down to Vicenza. And it was about a two or three hour drive one way. Um, so... All those patients would pile, would show up to the motor pool, pile into the van, usually a small van. And it was never, I mean, I always enjoyed the, the motor pool part didn't bother me. Like I, my sisters and I would enjoy ourselves on it. Um, so we would motor pool down to Vicenza, spend all day doing your appointments. And then you'd have to be back like, let's say 1600 to catch the shuttle back to the motor pool back at Aviano. Now Aviano back then, they still had the two different um, installations. They had the installation right at the foot of, foothills of the Dolomites where Aviano, the, the town is located. And then a little bit down the AP highway is where they had Aviano, the operational kind of day-to-day um, uh, goings on. Now that's no longer the case. The last time I was back in Aviano back in 06, they had like this massive fucking base exchange on what would have been exclusively just the mission back when I was stationed there, uh, or not stationed back when I lived there. So ta-da, we're at the appointment. Yay. My sisters get braces. I'm so jealous because I think they look hella fucking fly in their braces. I'm so fucking upset that my sisters get braces. I cannot stress this enough. And my sisters are not upset at all that I'm getting a headgear. They think it's fucking hysterical. Oh, it's about to get even more hysterical. So we walk out of there. My mom's got five kids to wrangle to get back to this bus. No AC on the bus, long hot day. Oh, this was this was summer between fifth and sixth grade. Well, did I mention one of our classmates was on the bus? No, I did not. That's Joseph Palmer. Now, Joseph Palmer was a very sweet boy. Very, very sweet little boy. Um, I even, I liked Joseph Palmer. I thought he was a kind kid. I did not, he was, um, what in the 80s, what you might have regarded as maybe, maybe like a little slow and it could have just been he was a late bloomer like me right or just shy so i don't, I don't really know um what the story was all i know is he was a very kind little boy and he was always kind to me he was always pleasant to me and my sisters thought the same of him we we weren't like in his peer group i wasn't really in anybody's peer group i don't fucking know work um joseph was kind of a little too now that i think about it um I'm not going to call him a dork, but he might have been what other people might have called a dork. I don't know. Um, I, I thought he was a nice little boy. Um, he was in my sister's grade. 
Well, bear that in mind about Joseph Palmer. So his mother was also a very nice lady. I remember his mom and she was all, always very, very sweet to my sisters and me. Very, very kind, um, warm, gregarious lady. And I, I don't, I think she was like a teacher or something, or she was like a civilian employee at Aviano. Cause I don't, I don't think there was, um, a, a husband in the picture if I remember correctly. So anyway, anyway, um, we get back to the motor pool at Vicenza to catch the, or the, the stop, the shuttle stop at Vicenza to go back to the motor pool in Aviano. And um, I've all but forgotten about my headgear blues. We pile into the bus. It's, kids used to call my family the Brady Bunch because we had so many goddamn kids. And we Brady Bunch our way into this fucking little bus without AC on it. Yeah, I do be like that. Um, didn't, didn't even notice it was missing as a kid. Yeah. Um, now I'd be like, holy shit, crank that fucking AC up, I'm having a hot flash. Um, so we get back on the bus and my mom says, where's your headgear? And I said, it's here. And I don't know where here was. I, I, mu I must have put it in my backpack. And she said, words that I will never forget, put it on. And I said, oh, but mom, I don't have to wear it except for not put it on. But when she said put it on the second time, it didn't come out like put it on. Like I just said, it came out in slow motion. I heard put it on. And as it like drew out of her mouth, I could see my, what little street cred I had garnered in fifth grade um, to get away from fourth grade just completely erode before my very eyes. And I started crying. Yeah. I got teary eyes and said, Mom, please no. Put it on right now. So I put it on. And it was, it was a hassle. Like, I, I know the doctor told me how to do it. I know we went over it in the doc in the orthodontist office. But it was a hassle. I had these, uh, these hooks that are glued to the back of my teeth on either side. And what I would do, for, I, I should bring up a picture of the, the headgear because, you know, maybe younger kids have never seen a headgear before. Um, that's a very likely possibility, headgear. Um, we'll just do Punky Brewster. I think his name was Alan, Punky Brewster from Alan. Headgears are a blow job, let me just say that. Um, where's the kid with the headgear? Come on, Punky Brewster. Where's the kid with the headgear? Don't, uh-uh, don't you Mandela affect me. I know there was a kid on Punky Brewster with the fucking headgear. I know. Uh-uh. Oh, no. Okay, I just look up headgear. 1980s. Because I'm sure, I'm sure the headgear of today is, um, oh, God. Oh, God. I'm having flashbacks. This was me. That's not really me. That's actually much better looking than what I looked like. I looked like a little boy in fifth grade going into sixth grade. So I didn't need any help. I didn't, I didn't need any help with the concertina wire strapped to my goddamn face out in public. My mom thought differently. My mom, my mom wanted me to break that headgear in and get over the whole breaking in phase because my mom knew it was going to be unpleasant. And it was, it was not, it did not feel good. It took a while for my mouth to get used to that. But anyway, going back to the little van. And when I say van, this is like a Scooby size van, right? Um, maybe a seven to 10 seater, not including the drivers. Um, and a dainty seven to 10 seater at that. Um, we're in the van. There's Joseph with his mother. I think he had, that's right. Joseph had to go to the podiatrist. That's right. That's what I learned what a podiatrist was on that bus ride. Um, but Joseph had gotten back from the podiatrist and my mother is, and I, I was not yet in that phase where I would talk back to my mom. I would get angry at my mom, but I would never express it to her. I was starting to get into that phase where I would, I would feel like anger or resentment towards her. Um, 
but it was negligible and certainly I would not have expressed it. I, that didn't come until about 13 when I became what I guess my sisters consider rebellious. So anyway, anyway, my mom is not fucking around. She's like, put it on and I complied. I get that motherfucker in my mouth. You gotta like wiggle it in and it feels like shit. Like when you're not used to it, it feels like there's something clamping down, not on your face necessarily. Like that part, the, the part with the, the metal protruding, that part does not really feel that bad. You would think that would be the uncomfortable part. No, it's the stuff inside that hurts. Um, I ran, and I'm not somebody who runs fevers. Um, I, I had a low grade fever for a few days getting used to the headgear. I hated it. I couldn't sleep in it at first. I would toss and turn. Um, I just got to a point where I would take it out at night. I, I would be like, there's no way I'm not sleeping. It, it, it hurt. I hated it. I hated it. And, um, I think I put up such a silent resistance with my mom. She just, I stopped wearing it. I still have an overbite. I got my overbite still, but I got rid of the headgear. Um, anyway, back on that Scooby bus, I realized my mom means business and I better fucking um, suck it up buttercup real fucking fast. My sisters are fucking dying. Like Liz and Angie, oh, they are fucking dying. And who can believe them? It's fucking hysterical. We all knew what Pucky Brewster was. We're not, my sisters and I could not be mandela out of that image. Um, they were dying. Well, here's where it gets worse. Joseph Palmer turns around. This sweet boy who did not have a bad bone in his body. Sweet, kind, gentle little soul. Bless his heart. He turns around and he just starts laughing at me. Well, I, and he wasn't doing it to be mean. He just probably hadn't seen that before. You know, that's a normal response. It's probably like, what the fuck is on her face? But in a very childlike way. It was, when I, and I knew even at the time, he wasn't laughing to be mean. Like, and it wasn't even a mean laughter, like the tone of the laughter. But he found it, he found it authentically funny. And honestly, now me, shit, by the time I was 13, I thought that shit was fucking hysterical. It didn't take too long. Once I no longer had to be strapped into that thing in public, I didn't give a shit. Um, okay, let me rephrase. Once the fact that my face had been strapped into that thing in public had been essentially removed from the hearts and minds of my sisters and our peer group. I didn't give a shit. It was fucking hysterical. Um, so yeah, um, Joseph Palmer was laughing hysterically at me without even trying. Like he, like not even trying to be mean. It was just funny. And like, who can, like good on Joseph Humor for having an immense sense of humor. Joseph Palmer, did I call him humor? Hmm. Um, and good on him for having a great sense of humor as a young kid, teaching me how to laugh at myself. Wow, what a friend, what a friend. So in response, cause I'd never seen Joseph Palmer in all the years that I'd interacted with him, this would have been going on four years, um, do anything what I would consider remotely unkind. And it, I just started crying. Oh my God, I was gutted. I just, I cried all the way home on that bus. But luckily by the time we got home to our shithole house in Aviano, we, we um, two years after we moved to Italy, we left our townhouse from um, where we lived in San Carino and we moved to Aviano. It was not a good move for us at all. Um, anyway, uh, yeah. I By the time we got home to our shithole in Aviano, it was a San Violetta neighborhood. That might not even exist anymore. Over by the castle, um, my face hurt. It was throbbing. I was uncomfortable. I was starting to feel nauseated. I was starting to get a headache from it. I didn't even care. I was just like, oh, mom, this hurts so bad. Let me take it off. Hated it. Hated it. 
Hate it. Anyway, um, shit. It's been almost, uh, make sure there's nothing else I have to hit up. Um, oh, 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 yes. I did want to talk about the Air Force Twitter. Oh my God. It is so fucking delusional. It's not even funny. Like what the fuck? What the fuck do these, what are these people thinking? What are these people thinking? So here's one. Our airmen are our defining advantage with an arm flexing, like Rosie the Riveter. The experiences and expertise of our airmen that our airmen bring to our force is what sets us apart. Check out Tech Sergeant Kevin Longcott's story. Uh, it's a DEI plug. I will tell you that right off the top of my head. Pass. Um, I, I, I'm not gonna deal with the hypocrisy. I've already talked about it. Yeah, pass. Air crew from the 121st Air Refueling Wing recently conducted survival evasion resistance and escape water survival training required every three years to maintain familiarization with life-saving equipment and procedures in the event of a waterborne evacuation. Um, I would say in this day and age, Air Force, your personnel should not be training they should be defending our border. Now's not the time for training. Now's the time to showcase the training that you've been training on to train on for all those long years of training on training. Now's the time to showcase the training. Now's not the time to showcase SEER. Ooh, whoop de doo SEER. Really? Now's not the time. Oh my God, that, that, this should be a picture of a real world mission, um, at least a humro to, to help Texans and New Mexicans and Arizonians along the border who are, who are being uh, directly impacted by the, I'm not gonna call that a border crisis. If you're calling that a border crisis still, you're living in la la land, that's an invasion. Our, we have been invaded, our country has been invaded. Those aren't migrants. Those are military age people who, I've said it once, if I've said it a million times, were fit enough to make the relatively quick march from Venezuela all the way to our border. Ooh, Venezuela, nothing to see here, said no one ever. You wanna talk about ties to the CCP and, and the Russians among other facet or other bodies of, of um, nefarious objectives yeah venezuela hello hello um not a border crisis our country has been invaded the federal government refuses to even acknowledge it we are not even allowed to question president biden according to kareen jean pierre hmm not a border crisis. Now is not the time The time for training, DOD. Now is the time to showcase the sum total of decades of training in Southcom. Not a border crisis. Southcom's in on it. You can count on that. Southcom's not protecting us. Southcom's protecting them. Yeah. Not a border crisis. We've been invaded. We have senior ranking military officials who were happy to look the other way as long as they got promoted, as long as they got their perquisites. What a goddamn shame. Thank God. Thank God we can rely on Twitter for the exchange of free speech. Free speech is how we're going to resolve this invasion. Free speech is how we're going to beat back this invasion as peacefully, as peacefully as possible. Thank God, thank God we have at least one platform that we can count on for free speech. And the American people, the numbers don't lie. Twitter is now, if I remember correctly from the other day, it's now the number one news app. Wow, the people don't lie. Um, 
let's see what else Air Force is doing. Um, exciting news from Edwards Air Force Base. The new facility will pave the way toward digital transformation for experimentation, development, testing, and high-end advanced training of fifth generation and other advanced weapon systems. That's great. Hey, what are your neighbors to the south in California? What are they thinking about all the cartel activity? What about San Francisco? Oh, hmm. interesting. What about the invasion along the Texas border? Not the first time Texas has been invaded. Not by far, not by far. Texas has been under, I believe, six flags to date. The last time Texas was invaded would have been, what, the 1850s? When did the, when did they, um, Beat back the Mexicans, the Mexican army, the Habsburg backed Mexican army. Sweet mother of God. Yeah, um, these people should not be focusing on dog and pony shows right now. No. This, this is, we have a mission essential crisis on our hands. We have an invasion. We've been invaded, not for the first time. If you remember just a couple months ago, a Chinese balloon, not for the first time, according to DOD, a Chinese balloon invaded our airspace from the north. Hmm. Wow. It's almost like they've got us surrounded. Hmm, very interesting, very fucking interesting. Um, and these people are cutting ribbons. Are you kidding me? Are you, you should be updating, you should be updating your followership, US Air Force. They have 1.5 million followers. You should be updating your followership regarding what you are doing to address this invasion, nothing. Now, instead, they want to talk about um, Tech Sergeant Kevin Longquat's story. Now, I'm going to guess he might be a very pleasant human being and a great worker. I'm not going to take that away from Tech Sergeant Kevin Longquat. What I am going to say, this is an obvious DEI propaganda piece. Maybe not from his end, and I could probably learn a lot from him watching it, but this is obviously a DEI propaganda piece. Um, you guys at the U.S. Air Force are yet again making visible signs of diversity, which oftentimes are very superficial, but prioritizing visible signs of diversity above the mission. Why? Why are you guys not censuring what's being done? Holy shit, what a what a waste of congressionally invested or congressionally vested authority. What a fucking waste. Okay, let's see what else we have. Um PACAF. US Air Force and Philippine Air Force members work together to integrate F-16 operations with AS 211s. The Security Forces subject matter expert exchanges were informative and collaborative. Another fucking exercise. Another fucking training. No! Air Force, wake the fuck up. Oh my god, this is embarrassing. May is National Military Appreciation Month. Hey, I'm not feeling too appreciative these days. Um, less celebration, maybe, Air Force. And um, more information. Relevant information elucidating information, reliable information, honest information. I would, I would love an update. I would love, I would love to hear about what the Air Force is doing to advocate for senior Airman Jack Teixeira so we don't see another enlisted force peon get crucified unnecessarily and unfairly. Um, nothing, they're doing nothing. Oh, to all our military spouses, past and present, thank you for all you do. Another DEI puff piece. It's um, 
what appears to be a transgender officer and the transgender officer spouse talking about their comedy shows at the base club. Guess what? Nobody, I did not go to the base club. After the mid 2000s, after Korea, I said, nah, no thanks. I, I, I did go, not frequently when I was at Whiteman, but I had enough friends who would go for, um, it was Boston Buddy Night where you would get 10 cent wings and like dollar beers. So it was very common that my friends would go. So I, I would go to Boston Buddy Night every now and again um, and karaoke. Um, but it, after Whiteman, nah, fuck, but nobody goes to the base club. Are you kidding me? So it's another DEI puff piece to put on display. Hey, look what, look how inclusive we are. Oh my God, we're so diverse. I don't care that this squadron has an officer who might be transgender, who is married to a woman and they have two, I don't care. And for her to be like, we we did a comedy show at the base club um, and they, won, they raised $3,000. Um, here's where I'm gonna call bullshit. Here's what happened to that. Um, I've seen it once if I've seen it a million times. Probably a handful of commanders on base said, hey, this is important. We have to boost awareness. So let's each put in like 500 bucks. Yeah. Which in turn, again, not that high, but just throwing out, this happens. And then in turn, the enlisted are like, oh, well, he's donating. Well, now I feel kind of like pressure to donate and now they've got people in positions of authority walking around the place of duty asking for donations um, or to buy these tickets. I don't wanna go to the show. I know it's not gonna be funny. It's gonna be about as entertaining as that disturbing tweet that, um, that the, um, that animation that Optibot retweeted where what appears to be a woman, but I guess is non-binary, is talking to a robot who has just discovered they're non-binary. Oh my God. That's what the comedy show was probably about. It was probably fucking lame AF because they wouldn't have been allowed to curse except to say shit um, or F that or but. Oh my God, no, no enlisted, no no NCO worth their salt would have shown up to that comedy routine. They would have known it was a bullshit fucking biscuit. Mm -mm. Nah, nah, I don't buy it. I know, nice try Air Force, nice try on the DEI puff piece. Guess what, guess what? I, I had, I knew people in the Air Force who were gay back when I was, active duty even during the era of don't ask don't tell i knew they were gay i just didn't ask i didn't tell them about my sex life either yeah don't ask don't tell people look at that and i did too for the longest time i looked at it as oh wow what a step forward don't ask don't tell and the often forgotten third component don't pursue so when they got rid of don't ask, don't tell, they also got rid of don't pursue. How do you think that worked out for women like me in the military? Don't pursue, not having that anymore. Hmm, yeah, hmm, interesting. Now that I don't want their Johnson and they can ask me if I want their Johnson and then tell me because I don't want their Johnson, I'm wrong. Now they can make up shit about me like John Riccio did. John Riccio, um, hey John Riccio, not watching this from home here, right? He's probably stroking one out right now, barf, bleh. Um, please don't money shot me, man, please. I can, I can do without the money shot, John Riccio. I am not your stripper. I'm not your stocked stripper. Stripper stalker, that's what he is. Incel stripper stalker. How's that for alliteration? Mm. Yeah, when I made it abundantly clear to John Rico that I was not, I didn't, not only did I not want his penis in a 50 mile radius 
within a 50 mile, mile radius of me. I didn't even want his personality. I just thought he was very toxic and disgusting and um, he didn't like that. So according to Yvonne Hartshorn, she told me to my face, she's the type of bitch who would deny it. I don't care. Her word in her ugly ass Louis Vuitton bag collection mean less than nothing to me. Um, <clears throat> shit, she couldn't even fucking finish a, what, what's that, DeVry's, that university, it's not even a university, you just fucking pay them. She couldn't even fucking finish her fucking bachelor's at a place where you just have to pay them and claim life experience, like a paragraph. That's all you had to do to get your bachelor's. She couldn't even fucking figure that out. So anyway, um, Yvonne told me to my face, this would have been in probably mid-2017, early to mid-2017, that John Riccio, whom I had just rebuffed again from unwanted harassment. At this point, it wasn't even I'm interested in you. It was straight up harassment and straight up reprisal and retaliation from a senior and CEO. I was a tech, he was a senior, uh, a master sergeant, pardon me. Um, so anyway, um, Yvonne Harshorn told me to my face that the week prior, not in this time frame, but back then, that John Riccio had shared whatever the latest thing was that I'd done to him, meaning he had retaliated against me again or harassed me again, and I escalated it up the chain of command for, for redress because it was getting out of hand. So he was sharing his knowledge and from and it's not that his knowledge was wrong, but the obviously the perspective was quite slanted. Um, told everybody on the floor, who whomever that was, Yvonne named a couple people. Colonel Cummins, according to Yvonne, was one of them. And why Colonel Cummins? In retrospect, why he didn't shut that down if he were there? Shame on him. Um. John Riccio allegedly told the entire skiff floor working on Title X live mission that I was not trustworthy, that I did not deserve a security clearance, and that I should be denied a security clearance. In front of the full bird. Yeah, this is a this is a scene this is a senior NCO who is not personally well regarded, but professionally exceptionally regarded. Cause cough, cough, I'm sure he wink winks and turns the other way. That's usually what that means these days. Um, but yeah, somebody who presumably given his Intel career, his illustrious Intel career would presumably be somebody that officers might listen to. Yeah denigrating me, telling people actively on the skiff floor that I was not trustworthy. Yvonne's words, not mine. And again, you know, I don't generally ask liars, to be honest. I know Yvonne is a liar. I know Yvonne has no sense of integrity or loyalty. So it's not like I would reach back to Yvonne and be like, hey, did you say that to me? Can I get an omission of of you saying that you said that to me. No, I'm never gonna get it. Yvonne's a fucking liar. Yvonne, Yvonne will say and do what she needs to say and do to have a nice car, nice handbags, nice trips. Yeah, Yvonne's a piece of shit. Yvonne, I would love to know with the credit issues you had um, in the not so distant past, I would love to know Yvonne when Hartshorn, Hartshorn not watching this from home. One, how were you able to main that TSSCI? And two, how the fuck are you able to travel like you're able to travel? Now, I know from, from investigating Sergeant Belton's leave paperwork that he was taking extensive, up, up to 15 days. Yes, I, I researched this for my fucking self. Sergeant Belton, my immediate supervisor, who was having me come in at Lieutenant Chris Parker's beck and call to work 12 hour days. Sergeant Belton was taking about on average 15 days of undocumented leave per month for a year, at least a year. This went on for a year. And I know that it was about 15 days 
on average per month because those were generally the days that I was working. He would call the night before that he was supposed to relieve me at 10, or I'm sorry, at um, if he was supposed to work the shift the following day. It would be on the schedule that he was working days in the skiff, but he would call me the night before and say, hi, I can't come in tomorrow, so instead of coming in at two, to work an eight hour shift in eight hours, a five, six day spread, 10 day spread even of eight hour shifts is very, very manageable. When we're getting into 12 hour shifts, ooh, especially with a long drive and I had a very long drive and there were many days I had to keep like my eyes open, keep from falling asleep at 11 o'clock at night driving the blue route, hoping I didn't hit a deer. Um, many nights, especially when I worked five twelves in a row. That was brutal. So Sergeant Belton was taking the days that he was supposed to work days to, to um, help me not have to work a full 12. Yeah, he was with regularity for at least a year taking 15 days of undocumented leave per month. I found out because I found his 988 and I saw his leave balance. And I said, there's no way he has that many days. It was insane. I said, there's no way he should, I mean, he should have a lot less leave than I do. And I didn't have much leave because I actually took leave when I was supposed to take it. Um, and when I took leave, it was usually to visit my soon to be ex-spouse's um, family in Germany for about three weeks at a time. Um, so it made sense that I didn't have any leave. It would have made sense that he had even less leave, if any. Um, and what I saw was he was in use or lose status. Yeah, that's when I started looking through the metrics that Parker had us, um, tracking. And that's when I found different pieces of official documentation to corroborate my, oh shit, you shouldn't have a leave balance that high. Oh yeah, a year, a year. So uh, with that said, when Jeremiah Camp, my commander, asked Sergeant Belton, and Camp told me this to my face, well, I asked Sergeant Belton, he said he wasn't doing that. Hey, dumbass, why would he admit to it? Here's a thought. With the information I shared with you and the paper trail and document documentation I shared with you, just start a fucking command-directed invest investigation. Instead of asking the person casually, Sergeant, Ta Sergeant Wick came to my office and said she's been talking to you about this and then said that you're doing nothing and then she found this out. No. He just took Sergeant Belton at face value and came back to me. Sergeant Belton said he never did that. Dumbass. Yeah, because criminals are like, hey, here I am, I'm guilty, idiot. Oh my God. Anyway, anyway, that, that, I, I extrapolate from my Belton experience to Yvonne because Yvonne has the same character on display as Belton. Um, neither one is reliable, neither one is trustworthy in, in the sense that they, yeah, they don't have integrity. It's not that they're, they try to be untrustworthy. It's just that when somebody questions them, they don't have integrity. That's the, the type of untrustworthiness I'm kind of discussing. Not like a pathological liar untrustworthiness. No, nah, not like that. Anyway, anyway, um, I gotta get going to do nothing, probably. I still don't really feel like doing anything. Um, maybe I'll go get some fresh air later on. I don't know, I don't know, we'll see. Um, for people not watching this at home, um, I hope you have a wonderful Mother's Day. Whatever you do, I hope you get to celebrate the mothers in your life and um, make today about them. And uh, yeah, and, and I hope the weather cooperates. Jesus Christ, I hope the weather cooperates. Nothing better than, you know, treating your mom to brunch and um, eating al fresco on a nice little patio. Um, man, it, I, I wouldn't mind having a nice little lunch with my mom in due time, in due time. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.